halt mal auf dem langsamen Jaya, warte mal, da war auch für uns abwechselnd. <lacht> Kannst du das noch überrücken? Die brauchen wir nicht. Om Magyanti Mandasya Gyananjala Shalakaya Chakshun Militam Dhinna Tasmai Shri Govinamaha Shri Chitanya Manupistam Stabadam Yenabhutale Svayam Upakadamayam Dhanati Svabhadantikam Namaham Vishnu Bhadakasya Bhutale Shimate Bhaktivedanta Swami Nitti Namane Namaste Saswati Deve Govani Pajayne Nivishisha Shrivari Pashatari Shatarine Vanchakapa Tuvisha Kripas in Vevata Padita Nampava Nebu Vaishnavi Vyunamunamaha Jai Shri Krishna Titanya Pabunityananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasadi Go Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ramo, Hare Ramo, Ramo Ramo, Hare Hare. I would like to speak in English. Is this okay? So, is there anybody who can translate for the show? So we're reading from Canto 3, chapter 24, <coughs> verse number 33. <coughs> Purusham <coughs> Mahantam <coughs> 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 
Pardon, hang on, did I chant Omnia Mova Gavitya Vasudevaya? No. Sorry. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So once again Canto 3, chapter 24, verse number 33. Param padanam purusham mahantam. Param padanam purusham mahantam. Kalam kavim trivritam lokapalam. Kalam kavim tri vritam loka palam Atmanu butyanu gata papancham Atmanu butyanu gata papancham Swachanda shak Sim kapilam papatye Swachanda shaktim kapilam papatye Param padanam purusham mahantam Kalam kavim tri vikam loka palam Atmanu butyanu gata papancham Satchanda shaktim kapilam papadye Somebody change. Ladies. Param, transcendental, Padanam, supreme, Purusham, person, Mahantam, who is the origin of the material world, Kalam, who is time, Kavim, fully cognizant, Trivritam, 
three modes of material nature. Lokapalam, who is the maintainer of all the universes. Atma, in himself. Anubhutya, by internal potency. Anugata, dissolved. Papancham, who is material manifestations. Svachanda, independently. Shaktim, who is powerful. Kapilam, to Lord Kapila. Pabadye, I surrender. Translation by Shlup Prabhupada. I surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, descended in the form of Kapila, who is independently powerful and transcendental, who is the Supreme Person and the Lord of the sum total of all matter and the element of time, who is the fully cognizant maintainer of all the universes under the three modes of material nature and who absorbs the material manifestations after their dissolution. So now comes the purport. The six opulences, wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation, I indicated here by Kadama Muni, who addresses Kapila Muni, his son, as Param. The word param is used in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam in the phrase param satyam to refer to the summum bonum or the supreme personality of Godhead. Param is explained further by the next word, padanam, which means the chief, the origin, the source of everything. Savakana karnam, the cause of all causes. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is not formless. He is Purusham, or the enjoyer, the original person. He is the time element and is all cognizant. He, know <coughs> he knows everything, past, present, and future, as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. The Lord says, I know everything, present, past, and future, in every corner of the universe. The material world, which is moving under the spell of the three modes of nature, is also a manifestation of his energy. Parasya Shaktiya Vividaiva Suyate. Everything that we see is an interaction of his energies. This is from Svetashvata Upanishad 6 8. Parasya Brahmana. Shakti Tatedam Akilam Jagat. This is the version of the Vishnu Purana. We can understand that whatever we see is an interaction of the three modes of material nature. But actually, it is all an interaction of the Lord's energy. Loka Palam. He is actually the maintainer of all living entities. Nityo Nityanam. He is the chief of all living entities. He is one, but he maintains many, many living entities. <coughs> God maintains all other living entities, but no one can maintain God. That is his Svachanda Shakti. He is not dependent on others. Someone may call himself independent, but he is still dependent on someone higher. The personality of Godhead, however, is absolute. There is no one higher than, he, than or equal to him. Kapila Muni appears as the son of Kadama Muni. But because Kapila is an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Kadama Muni offers respectful obeisances unto him with full surrender. Another word in this verse is very important. Admanu bhutyana nugata parapancham. The Lord descends either as Kapila or Rama, Nishinga or Vraha. And whatever forms he assumes is in the material world 
sorry, and whatever form he assumes in the material world are all manifestations of his own personal internal energy. They are never forms of the material energy. The ordinary living entities who are manifested in this material world have bodies created by the material energy. But when Krishna or any one of his expansions or parts of the expansions descend on this material world, although he appears to have a material body, his body is not material. He always has a transcendental body. But fools and rascals who are called mudhas consider him one of them, and therefore they deride him. They refuse to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they cannot understand him. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Avajayanti Mamuda, those who are rascals and fools, they deride me. When God descends in a form, this does not mean that he assumes his form with the help of the material energy. He manifests his built form as he exists in his built kingdom. Oof, heavy purport. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the verse and also the purport very much reminds of the yesterday's purport because they are Prabhupada, very similar points he makes there. He also talks about the opulences and you know how the Lord appears in all these different forms and so on, Raha and Shinga, you know, very similar. And throughout the Bhagavatam we can actually see how again and again this topic is established that the Lord is supreme in all aspects, in all regards, you know, again and again. And Prabhupada is almost, he is hammering it onto us, you know. Why? Because the disease of the living entity in this material world thinks that he is supreme, you know, that he wants to be the controller, he wants to be the proprietor of everything, he wants to be the enjoyer. This is why we are here in this material world. So therefore, throughout the Bhagavatam, again and again and again and again, this point is made. Just so we hopefully get it one day. <laughs> and we can also, um, yeah, we can say that actually, you know, many of these parts of the Bhagavatam where these more technical parts are established, that they are actually a little dry for us, many of us, you know, a little dry, a little technical, and somehow not so relishable. Especially the first few cantos, we have many of these parts where the whole creation and the energies and, and Vishnu forms and how it all works, and, you know, you wonder, my God, okay, you know, why, why do we have to all understand this so deeply? Well, it is simply meant to bring us to this point of surrender. That's what it's all about, you know. And I mean that uh, term surrender comes once in the verse and then also in the second paragraph of this long purport, you know, where, where it is explained, yes. Um, Kadama Muni fully understands Krishna's uh, Kapila Dev's position and therefore he fully surrenders. So we can say, you know, the, the Sambandha Gyan, this knowledge of who am I, who is the Supreme Lord, and what is this whole material creation all about? What is it for? This is the Sambandha Gyan, which we all have to receive, at least in some in some vague understanding, you know. And that will hopefully lead us to this understanding, okay, the Lord is great, omniscient, you know, omnipotent with all his energies, simply amazing, and I'm tiny, tiny small, so I better surrender to him, I better serve him, you know. That's... That's the whole purpose of these more theoretical um, parts in the Bhagavatam, just to 
bring us to this point of surrender. So that's why the Bhagavatam, you know, uh, gradually develops up to the tenth canto, which is the Lord's smiling face. Then we come to all the beautiful pastimes. So if the Bhagavatam would start with this, then we wouldn't have that preparation of really understanding, you know, Krishna's position and our position, you know. So that's why, you know, one should go step by step through the whole Bhagavatam and especially oh, in first canto is, is so theoretical, you know, and their Prabhupada's purports are so lengthy because I have heard that you know, Prabhupada was thinking that maybe he will not even have enough time to to translate more than the first canto. So that's why he put so much into the first canto and the purports. And some of these purports, there's several pages, you know, <laughs> that, that they're really long. You know, and he establishes all the basic philosophy there in, in these purports, you know. And then Prabhupada repeats himself so many times. He doesn't just say it once or twice, but so many times, so many times. You know, because yeah, in Kali Yuga, we're all pretty thick-headed and <laughs> we just have to hear it again and again and again. You know? And this is why hearing the Bhagavatam is also so important, regular hearing. You know? yes. Not only when we live in the temple, but also as family person, you know, living in family life. If family life should be an ashram, then the Bhagavatam has to be a very important part of our daily life, you know. And our whole life has to be molded. The Bhagavatam and the Holy Name are the center, you know. Yes, it's a whole, whole big topic, you know. Because unless we hear the Bhagavatam again and again and again, then very easily material energy is so strong and just covering over our consciousness and we forget immediately, you know. Yes, yes, very, very important, this regular hearing, you know. And I mean, we can, we can wonder, so knowledge, what is actually the purpose of knowledge, you know. I remember many years ago, um, His Holiness Krishna Kshetra Maharaj came to to Sweden for a festival. I had invited him there as a speaker. And he was giving an overview of the first eight kentos or something of the Bhagavatam. And I thought, wow, okay, great, let's go and hear. And I was sitting there with a piece of paper and a pen and I wanted to take some notes, but I couldn't understand anything, nothing. I couldn't even write down one sentence. It was just poof, right over my head. Couldn't understand anything. And then afterwards, then afterwards I went up to Marge and I said, Marge, I thought I have some little taste and attraction to hearing the Bhagavatam, but I, I couldn't understand anything, you know? I really felt that urge to tell him and share and see what he says. And then he just looked at me and smiled and said, because it's all not important. <laughs> that was his answer. It's all not important. You don't have to know all these things. You, know? you, you just serve. Because that's actually the purpose of all knowledge, to bring us to this point of serving in devotion, in surrender. You know, and there is a nice purport which I have copied here in my little verse book where Prabhupada <coughs> makes this point. This is fourth canto, 25th chapter, verse 62. There Prabhupada says, the platform of knowledge is advantages because it is a means by which one may come to the stage of devotional service. However, if one takes to devotional service directly, knowledge is revealed without separate endeavor. Wow, interesting. 425.62. So in other words, 
in this process of acquiring transcendental knowledge, there's like two steps. The first step is to understand the basic Sambandha Gyan. Who am I? Who is Krishna? What is this whole world all about? And then that hopefully should lead us to serving. You know, I remember I once heard this Christian prayer. God is great. God is good. Thank you for our food. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we are meant to come to this point. God is great. God is good. Okay, I, I better I better serve, you know. So that's the purpose of the Sambandhi Gyan. And then, as Prabhupada says in this purport, however, if one takes to devotional service directly, knowledge is revealed without separate endeavor. So that's the step number two of receiving transcendental knowledge, that through our service attitude, Krishna responds by giving realizations, by re revealing himself and giving understanding how Maya works, how Krishna works, and, and, and. This does not come through just accumulating knowledge, book knowledge. You know, realization doesn't come through studies, it comes through serving in Krishna revealed. You know, yeah, it's very important to understand. You know. So that's the step number two then, you know, that we serve. That's why it is so important to develop a selfless, genuine service attitude, because that's what attracts Krishna. And then he reveals, then he shows us, then he gives us insights, and so on, you know. So, yeah, there's also another nice purport, which I also copied under K for knowledge. This is 7.15.45, where Prabhupada says, simply getting the weapon of Gyan is insufficient. One must sharpen the weapon by serving the spiritual master and adhering to his instructions. Then the candidate will get the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You know? So there we have this analogy. Knowledge is like a sword, like a, a knife, a weapon. And unless it is sharpened through the service attitude, accepting Guru, being willing to sacrifice one's life for Guru's pleasure, it will remain a blunt knife. You cannot cut anything. You know? Yes. So, good to remember. And this also gives, you know, actually, at least for me, this point gives me a lot of hope because I'm actually not so learned. People often think I know so much, but I actually don't. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever little preaching I can do is simply coming from Krishna by trying to sacrifice myself in service. That's definitely my position. Definitely my position. Yes. I don't know many verses by heart. And, and under Krishna Prabhu, oh my God, he knows, you know, 50,000 times more than I do. <laughs> you know, I'm just a simple, simple melody, you know. <laughs> but somehow Krishna gave me some realizations, some convictions, you know. And that is not through studies, definitely not, you know. Yes, so there's also another nice one of my favorites, a uh, nice little um, statement where Prabhupada says, this is in Teachings of Queen Kunti. Prabhupada says, it is not necessary to understand Krishna and how he creates. Krishna explains himself in Bhagavad Gita and we shall not try to understand much more. We should not bother much to know Krishna. That is not possible. <laughs> we should simply increase our unalloyed love for Krishna. That is the perfection of life. Right? I mean, of course, 
a little bit of knowledge is good for preaching because also, especially in these modern days, people are very top heavy, you know, they're very kopflastig, how we say in German, and they try to understand everything with their mind and intelligence and and and. So in preaching, definitely very helpful to have a bit of knowledge to convince those personalities, you know. But then many of us are very simple and uh, simple-hearted and, you know, we don't have to engage in all these mm, acrobatics there, and the intellectual acrobatics <laughs> or something, you know. For us it is, um, yeah, for simple-hearted people, Krishna consciousness is very simple. Okay, yes, of course, there's a supreme creator and enjoyer and source of everything, of course, makes sense, so let's serve, you know, so <laughs> pretty simple. No need to know all how Krishna creates and how it all works, because as Prabhupada says, you, you cannot understand Krishna anyway. It's not possible, you know, not possible. So simply... Let's concentrate to, to learn to love Krishna, you know. And that comes ultimately through service, through surrender. That is a, a sign of our beginning love, you know. Yeah. The more selfless we serve, the more bhakti will sprout there in our heart, you know. So now another thing that really came to my mind is, you know, seeing here how Kadama Muni is so fully conscious that his son is the supreme personality of Godhead. And therefore he glorifies him and he surrenders unto him, he pays obeisances unto him. I thought that was quite noteworthy because usually within family relationships there are more emotions involved, right? And a father we we'll always see, you know, as a rule, his son as little son, you know. But now Kadama Muni is fully conscious, you know, that Kapiladev, you know, he is the supreme personality of Godhead. So he's very much in this on this level of awe and reverence, very different to Nanda Maharaj, you know. Yes, very different because. Mandavaj, you know, they sometimes had some little clue, oh yes, maybe our son is some yeah, demigod or some yogi or oh, maybe he is a supreme personality. But then boom, it was gone again and covered over with with um, yoga maya. And, and yeah, and he could taste that sweetness, that parental um, vatsalya ras, you know. And whereas Kadama Muni did not get that opportunity, you know, to um, taste that. And there is also one purport, I didn't research it, but I remember reading this purport where Prabhupada says, yes, Vasudev and Devaki, they are less advanced, right, than Nandamaj and Mother Yashoda. Mother Yashoda and Nandamaj, they are, they are Nitya Siddhas. Whereas um, um, Vasudev and Devaki, and also Kadama Muni and Devahuti, they are sadhana siddhas. So that's, that's the difference. And there is also a very nice purport which I want to share, which is, however, not in Prabhupada's language, because it is 10th Kento, 28th chapter, which Prabhupada didn't. Um, translate anymore and I think in German you don't even have that part right because I was quickly looking because I was contemplating to give in in, in, in German language and I would have liked to take this purport with with me because it's a little difficult to translate I'm warning you here already but I find it very a very nice point which we don't really hear so often and which also has a practical application on our level. So this is 10th Kento, 28th chapter, verse number 13. There, I believe it must be Rita Nandamaj or whoever translated it. We can very clearly hear it's not Prabhupada's language, you know. 
there it says, in fact, describing Lord Krishna as the supreme controller and God is almost a type of political analysis, referring as it does to a hierarchy of power and control. Such analysis of levels of power and hierarchies of rule is significant in a context in which one entity is not fully surrendered in love to a higher entity. Right? It continues in a minute, but let me first make this point, you know, that when we, it, it's, it's quite a deep point actually, you know, that understanding Krishna as the Supreme Lord in seeing him, you know, as Supreme Controller, this, this understanding is only there for those living entities who are not yet fully surrendered in love to Krishna. Then they have this concept of supremacy and hierarchy of, how is it, hierarchy of rule and power. Right? So then the purport continues. In other words, control becomes visible or is consciously felt as control when there is resistance to that control. Right? So this is a pretty important point also for our practical life. You know, that if we feel, you know, that we are controlled, it actually means that there is um, a resistance. Then, you know, a superior personality or here Krishna is felt as controller because we are resisting, right? And now it continues to cite a simple example. A pious law-abiding citizen sees a policeman as a friend and well-wisher, whereas a criminal sees him as a threatening symbol of punishment. Uh, good example. There's this point clearly made. You know, if you if you follow the laws, you're not afraid of the police. You know, you don't feel threatened. Then a policeman becomes your protector and friend and well wisher. But if you don't follow the laws of the country and you're resisting, you know, that control. So then you see him as a threatening symbol of punishment. That's how the whole vision of this one and same personality changes according to our own attitude, whether we are surrendered or whether we resist. Right? So then Prabhupada continues, thus Lord, or not Prabhupada, sorry, but whoever, Thus, Lord Krishna is seen as a controller, in inverted commons, and hence as the supreme God by those who are not fully enchanted by his beauty and pastimes. Those fully in love with Lord Krishna focus on the sublime attractive features, and because of the nature of their relationship with him, they do not much notice his controlling power. Yeah, very nicely described. So, and yeah, this, this principle can be also applied on, on our daily levels. For example, in our relationship with Guru. You know? The more we surrender to Guru and actually follow his instructions and we try to please him, then we don't feel Guru as some, how was it here mentioned, fearful symbol of punishment or something, or somebody who is oh, controlling and, oh my God, hopefully, you know, I don't 
get somehow reprimanded or something. But no, then we have that attitude to Guru as being our best friend in Walrusha. You know, and we, we, we are not afraid of when we face some calamities in our spiritual life, some challenges, you know, then very often I notice this on my travels and dealing with devotees, difficulties and so on, then very often I can see people are not running to their spiritual master. They're fearful. They don't want to reveal their mind. They don't, you know, take shelter and ask for guidance. No, they're hiding, you know. And that comes when when we in our hearts have this resistance that we don't want to surrender, you know, then we see him, ooh, then we are afraid and we avoid to be seen by him and, and, and. But the more we give up this resistance in our hearts, you know, the more we are not fearful, you know. I mean, same example, of course, is Palat Maharaj and Shingadev, you know, when <laughs> Shingadev was so uh, furious and, and in anger, everybody was afraid. The demigods, they were all afraid because they were not fully surrendered in love to the Lord. You know, the gimme demigods, they do have material desires and motives and, and so on, you know. So, but Palat Maharaj was fully surrendered in love. He was not afraid to approach Lord Nishingadev, even though he was so furious, you know. Yeah, not only on the level of Guru, but even on the level of, in the community, senior devotees, managers, and, 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 you know, we can apply that principle as well, that we see a, a senior devotee or a manager, we experience them as a controller only if we resist. Yes. You know? Good, good to understand because, yeah, these topics often come up. Oh, this person is like this and always controlling and this and that. You know? Yeah, so we have that experience of being controlled only because we are the ones who resist. And as we develop a trusting relationship where we actually submit and we let go of our resistance, this is internal, you know, we have to let go of our resistance, but we submit and we, we simply serve. And of course, not blindly, there's always guru, sadhu, shastra and so on. But we let go of this resistance and wanting to be independent. You know, then we will not feel senior devotees or managers, leaders, we will not experience them as a threat. This comes only through our resistance. You know, we can't blame others, you know. And therefore, so everybody sees seniors and leaders, managers in a very different mood. You know, like like in the example with the policeman, you know, the criminal for him, the policeman is the uh, a symbol of th threat and punishment, you know. But to a law-abiding citizen, this is a good friend. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it really depends on how much we give up our resistance and we surrender and submit, and then, you know, the relationship will transform and change. Mm. In regards to surrender. We have still a little bit of time. I have also collected a few nice quotes over the years, you know, because surrender is a very, yeah, it's a very central, central topic in the whole process of Krishna consciousness. It's all um, centered around this process of surrendering oneself, you know. Yes, yes. So, yes, and I have collected a few nice little things. So here in Madhya, Chaitanya Chaitamrita, Madhya Leela 22, verse 100, in the purport, Prabhupada says, Self-surrender means remembering 
that one's activities and desires are not independent. The devotee is completely dependent on Krishna and he acts and thinks as Krishna desires. So this is easily said, you know, but to actually live it practically, to live accordingly, not so easy, not so easy, you know. And this de internal dependence, this is really one main aspect of the process of surrender, you know. So of course, Krishna is pretty remote, so that's why we need Guru. And actually to be connected to Guru, I've said this many times, but again and again I find it's good to hear <laughs> and remind ourselves, <laughs> to be connected to Guru means we have to actually feel in the heart dependent on Guru's mercy, on Guru's blessings, on Guru's guidance. Not only dependent, but helplessly dependent. That is a sign of surrender. That we feel helplessly dependent on Guru's and Prabhupada's mercy, guidance, blessings. And often for us also, Guru and, and Prabhupada are maybe still more remote. So that's why we are advised to practice these relationships within, amongst devotees, sheltering relationships. Yeah, that we should have at least one person in our life where we cultivate this internal dependence that we would not want to decide any serious, make any serious decision without asking for blessings, for guidance, for advice, you know, that there is this feeling of being helplessly dependent on the mercy of the Vaishnavas. Yes. I mean, without the mercy of the Vaishnavas, we cannot do anything. We are, we are products of mercy of the Vaishnavas, really. The longer we practice Krishna consciousness, the more we may realize this. You know, that we by ourselves, what can we do? You know, we cannot do anything. You know, we, we are a product of, of so much attention we get from, from the devotees, mercy in different ways, in the form of guidance, in the form of um, engaging, you know, somebody engages us in service, somebody corrects us, somebody inspires us, sometimes also chastises us, that special mercy. When somebody actually chastises and corrects us, we often think it's mercy to just get the pat off the back. Yes, you did a great, thank you, great. No, no, no. The special mercy if it is if somebody actually corrects and chastises us. You know? So yeah, we we get and, and we get mercy through friendship and so many things. You know, so we we are really a product of mercy of the version of us. And without that, what what would we be? You know, where where uh, would we be if not this mercy of the Vaishnavas? You know, we we would have no chance. You know, to somehow make some progress or something. There's also another few nice things about surrender. Also, Madhya Leela, chapter twenty-two, same chapter, but a few verses earlier. There it says, it's actually the verse, one is immediately freed from the clutches of Maya if he seriously and sincerely says, sincerely says, my dear Lord Krishna, although I have forgotten you for so many long years in the material world, today I am surrendering unto you. I am your sincere and serious servant. Please engage me in your service. Nay, no, that's the verse. Yes. Huh? Madhya 22, 33. Yes. Yes, so this, you know, 
this really shows how Krishna consciousness is such an internal process. This surrendering is an internal process. It's not an external process or, or just do what I told you to do, just surrender and wash the pots or clean the toilet. No, no that's, that's an external part, you know. But there's also an internal part of surrender, which is so much more important. It's the internal part, you know. You can, you know, bite your tongue and, all right, I'm doing the seva, you know, otherwise I'll get kicked out or whatever, you know. But that is not surrender. No, it's an internal thing, you know. We are meant to have that attitude that we say, you know, Actually, my dear Lord, you know, I've forgotten you for so long, many lifetimes. But today, from this day on, I'm yours, you know. From this day on, today I'm surrendering unto you. I'm your sincere and serious servant. Please engage me in your service. And then the next verse says, It is my vow that if one only once seriously surrenders unto me, saying, my dear Lord, from this day on I am yours. And praise to me for courage. I shall immediately award courage to that person and he will always remain safe from that time onwards. You know? So it's a deep internal thing, you know, the surrender. And actually one main aspect of cultivating surrender, we do this in chanting chanting Japa, you know, that we chant crying out in helplessness, please Krishna, I know you're there, please engage me from this day on, I want to be yours, you know, yes, because often people ask, so how do we cultivate the surrender and how to do it, you know, in the chanting, it's there, you know, if we only mindlessly blabbering the Maha Mantra down and we think of so many things, what we have to do and this and that. Well, chanting will not uh, give much result. We are meant to involve the heart and really call out to Krishna, from this day on I am yours. Please accept me. Please allow me to serve. That is the beginning of surrender. If we strive, at least we try to chant like this, you know. We may not be able to chant all 16 rounds in this mood. I'm not there. <laughs> I'm only practicing, <coughs> even after doing so many holy name retreats and all that, but still I'm not there yet. But at least we are striving, we are understanding, this is how I'm meant to chant, you know. So and every day, again and again, we try to put that feeling you know, that quality of feeling in our chanting that we call out to Krishna in helpless dependence and begging him, you know, please allow me to serve you, please accept me, you know. That is the beginning of surrender. And there is also another <laughs> nice quote where Prabhupada says, this is in second canto, seventh chapter, verse 46. But in the devotional, that this is the purport. But in the devotional service of the Lord, the only qualification required is surrender. Surrendering oneself is in one's own hand. If one likes, he can surrender immediately without delay, and that begins his spiritual life. Not and then. You know, his life begins, but no, and that, that process of surrender, that begins one's spiritual life, you know. Yeah, pretty powerful, you know. Prabhupada says, you know, the only qualification necessary is to surrender. And one can do it immediately. It's in one's own hands, you know, without delay. And that begins one spiritual life. Yes. Of course, we also have to say, <laughs> we have to balance it again. You know, it sounds like 
you know, okay, let's surrender. I can do it today, immediately. But there is also some spiritual strength and maturity required. Otherwise, maturity, reife. Yeah? Yes, otherwise this whole process of surrendering is just in the mode of passion. For its ego drive, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's, that can really damage one's spiritual life. Yeah. If this is done in this rajas, in this passionate mood, you know, of yes, Prabhupada says, can be done immediately, it's in my own hands, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Prabhupada says, yes, you know, if one likes, we can surrender immediately. But for most of us, it is a gradual process, you know. We have to build up the strength, the spiritual strength, faith. Without faith, there's no question of surrender. You know? That's why there's also a quote in the Bhagavad Gita where it says, you know, faith is one of the most important things in the process of devotional service. Because without faith, we cannot surrender. You know? And for most of us, it takes time until we build up that faith and that spiritual strength and that realization, you know. And that's why even in this process of surrendering also, we do need guidance, you know. We need somebody who can see where we are at and what is the next step up, you know. I mean, in the very early days of ISKCON, you know, the <laughs> that understanding was not so there. And often people were just immediately taken from the street, shaved up, you know, and, and so on in the first day, and okay, you know. So, but now we realize, no, we, we have to give people a little bit of space and time, you know, to gradually get there where they desire to shave up and become more, you know, strict and so on and so on. It cannot be forced and pushed on people. You have to surrender right now and so on, you know. No, no, it has to... But it took us in it's gone a few years to understand this, you know. Yes. So yeah, it's not such an easy thing that everybody can just do immediately today, but for most of us it is a gradual process and we need guidance. And very often if we don't have this guidance, you know, I've traveled for five months or so I've met a lot of devotees again and so on. So very often, if we don't have this guidance, we can become completely stagnant in our life. You know, we're just treading on the spot. You know, especially also if we live outside of the temple. You know, if there's not somebody who who can give us the hint, hey, why don't you, you know, move on to this um, situation, or you? You invite that aspect more prominently in your devotional life. You tighten up a little bit on this corner, you know, and so on. So we, we move forward, you know. Otherwise, if we don't have such a person in our life, again, it goes back to mentorship, importance to having a mentor, a coach, you know, then we can become completely stagnant. And we cannot even see, you know, because as long as we have material desires and attachments, we cannot objectively assess ourselves. We cannot see ourselves. We need somebody who can, in a loving, affectionate, well-wishing way, can help us to see where we can adjust things and gradually move forward. You know. and then we can you know, come closer and closer to this point of full surrender. You know. Okay, so I said a few things. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Um, excuse me, one more question. Um, you mentioned someone's uh, situation with this. Um, with the basically, what Renegade did is uh, I came to myself and I had some reformer situation and I really endeavored. And then I, I see him and, and it's a different relationship to what you said in the beginning. You entered the process. But then I had some time to. Uh, out or you didn't do your duties properly and then I feel like my guru can feel it and then suddenly I avoid him with it and 
Yeah, so that's exactly <laughs> the, the practical example. <laughs> Gurus. <laughs> I just want to <laughs> Hot question. <laughs> yes, yes. 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 A bigger sense gratification than than love. Very true. Yeah. Yes. Very true. This controlling others, you know, being in control of so many people, is more intoxicating than sex life, because in sex life you only control one person for your enjoyment. <laughs> You know, sex life is very much connected with control, with power. Yes, you know, you take power over one person to get your sense gratification. That's actually what's going on in sex life, you know. So there you only control one person. But if you control a lot of people, this is very intoxicating. It's a fact, very true, very subtle, you know, yes. Yes, but the beginning part, yeah, that's why, you know, we have to be very careful in our dealings, you know, when we are in a more leading position and so on, that we don't, you know, uh, yeah, get too much into this control, you know. <laughs> the control should be there through love and care, you know. That's a much stronger force of control than you know, uh, fear, you know, fear controls. If you don't do this, you get this and this reaction. So, okay, I will do it. So, the, the fear is one control, you know, but then love, you know, and care and affection, that ties up the hearts of a person and then they're willing to do anything. I mean, Prabhupada said the perfect example. He controlled to through his pure love and affection and care for his mm, disciples. And they were willing to do anything for Prabhupada. Yes, yes, yes. You know. So, and I mean, what you hinted there, that sometimes, and again, just to make this clear, we are not talking here about Simhajalam. <laughs> <laughs> not that I get in trouble or something. No, really, we are not. We are not talking about Samajla. But as you may know, I was for many years a, a member of the devotee care committee of the DBC strategic planning, and this was the topic there. You know, that devotee care. Actually, devotee care means we have to become more people focused and not only project focused. Yes. And I mean, I'm describing this all in this book, Sheltering Relationships, you know, that we cannot blame managers, you know, because managing is, is, is a big challenge. My God, I was enough in man management myself. I know what it's like. I was 10 years TP's wife in Riga. And then well, I was also very involved in management in Bangladesh. I was the vice president for quite a few years of Dhaka Temple, a temple with 120 Brahmacharis. And I was the vice president there. So, I mean, I, I do have some experience of management. <laughs> and I know it's a tough job to make ends meet. You know, all the bills have to be paid, all the, uh, you know, the devotees have to be engaged, and, 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 and of course, every manager, that's his task. He's got the managerial glasses on. Of course he does, because that's his duty. So, and that's why we need the brahmanas, you know, 
A true Brahmana should have no interest in position, title, power, control. His only interest is to see that everything is arranged in such a way that it is for the upliftment of everyone. That's the position of Brahmanas. You know, and Brahmanas should be bold enough to say what needs to be said because it's their function to uphold the standards. You know? Yes, especially in Kali Yuga. You know, the, the natural trend is always downhill towards degradation. So the Brahmanas play that often thankless task, you know, to uphold the standards and go against the natural stream of Kali Yuga degradation. It's a thankless task. So that's why, you know, one of the qualities of a Brahmana is that he is not dependent on public opinion, what people think of him and whether they like him. And or he has to be aloof of that. Otherwise, he cannot play that function to uphold the standards. You know? Yes. Not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and that's where the Brahmanas come in, that they are meant to be the aloof, brahminical advisors, you know, to help balance the kshatriyas, you know, the managers, to help them, you know, that really everything is for the benefit and upliftment of everyone, and not, on, oops, not only the project, that we not become only project-focused. You know, but that we become people focused. You know, that's that's the important uh, contribution of the Brahmanas, and that's why everybody actually needs such an aloof, medical advisor. Not only the managers, but actually everybody. You know, because easily, especially as we make progress in devotional life, we also become little controllers. We may be in charge of some department and this and that. You know, so, and there the Brahmanas should help us to, to balance, you know, that really everything is for the ultimate benefit of everyone to make spiritual progress, you know, and that this strong project uh, focus is balanced, you know. A whole big topic, as I mentioned, I wrote a whole book about this, you know. Yeah. Anything else, Prabhu? Your last comment where you said more more people focused and project focused, mm. but this is the this is then the challenge of the, as I said, of the prominical people who are engaged in prominical activities that uh, you said y they should up uphold the standards, standards mm. but this sometimes then becomes too much project. Focused, project focused. I don't speak about just only like properties, but also maybe uh, like 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 the, the the whole. This is the this is how it should be done. This is how it you know culture focused maybe. So and this was the uni unique uh, uh, character of Shiloh Prabhupada that he mm. could adjust. That he had mm. he he had he could he could uh, adjust to the public. It was not that Prabhupada was careless about the public opinion. I think Prabhupada was very careful about the public opinion in some points, not in all points. You know, when I said it's good yes. for the vegetarian society, Prabhupada was, you know, was <laughs> not not careful. But in general, he was quite careful, and he knew how to deal with everybody on his on his level. Exactly. He never shoot over their head. Yes. And exactly, and uh, this is, I think, where the, you, you were right. The managers they have to, uh, how you said, achieve the te no, the the ends. How you said the needs ends. Make, make the ends meet. Make, make, the, make the ends meet. Yeah, this is the this is the manager. Therefore, we need actually more leaders, yes. because the leaders yes. they can, yes, yes, they can uh, bring this all together. Yes, and uh, this is the difficulty sometimes on the top of the project. We have a manager. Who just uh, want that the ends meet, you know? And this, and and when he is the leader, then it's all about the project, and it becomes focused on about the project. But yes. when you have a really prominent leader, yes. he can take 
the whole picture in. Yes. Yeah, I mean, very true. See, often amongst us devotees, it is not even clear that there is a difference between manager and leader. I remember many years ago, I did this leadership and management course in Mayapur over five days with Anutama Prabhupada Sahib. You know, of course, this is 15 years ago, so I forgot a lot of it. But that I remember this point that only in this course I realized, ah, oh, there's a difference between a manager and a leader. They're very different. That as a rule, managing is more maintaining the status quo. I remember we had a whole, you know, some whole tabella there, some, some uh, graphic to put the moods of managers and leaders opposite, and they're almost opposite. <laughs> that a leader, he has the courage to take risks, you know, because he sees the picture and he wants to strive for that, and he's willing to take risks. Whereas a manager usually is not so keen to take risks. <laughs> he just wants to keep the the boat going and not rocking too much and so on, you know. So they're actually very, very different uh, moods and, and, and both are needed. And very often we face this, that a manager may think he is a leader and a leader may think he is a manager. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, and, but you need actually both. You need both. Even that simple fact you know, because also, unfortunately, we don't get so much training yet. And, you know, I'm sometimes jokingly say ISKCON is the only worldwide organization that puts people into positions without any training, no tools, nothing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Just, okay, here we go, be, be the temple president or head department or whatever. You know, no training, no tools, you know. But in, I mean, I highly recommend it to do this leadership and management course, even how to conduct a meeting. It's a whole thing, it's a whole art. How to conduct a, an effective meeting. Many of us have no clue, we have never learned this. And I remember when I was in this GBC mm, committee there for devotee care, sometimes we had these little educational breaks you know, and I remember one, we had these 10 meeting monsters. <laughs> there was with a PowerPoint presentation, you know. There's 10, probably if you Google meeting monsters, you may even find it, you know. There's 10 ways that really disturb a meeting completely, completely. The 10 meeting monsters, you know. And actually, we should be educated in this because yeah, some of us like to be one of these meeting monsters. You know? and one, for example, is to crack jokes all the time or go completely off the track and get lost in some other discussion there or the storm and arguments that you make, you know, some argument, you make it into an extreme, so it's ridiculous just to prove your point that this is all nonsense, you know, so there's all these, these meeting monsters, you know. I mean, there's so many things, you know, we, 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 we are lacking, you know, the tools and the training, you know. But I mean, now that they are making efforts, you know, we have this GBC college now that at least those, the next generation GBCs, they go through a whole training program now, you know. A few years ago, this was not there. This was not there, you know. There was no training given. And actually, you know, all, all, all the devotees who are in charge of something, they should have the solid training and it can be also freshened up and so on, you know. And there, yeah, we, we understand the difference between managing and leading, you know. Uh, big difference. And we need both. And they have to work in harmony, you know, because the leader likes to take risks and move forward, and the manager, oh no, please, no risks, you know, don't rock the boat. So th there has to be good understanding and cooperation, you know. Uh, otherwise, the project cannot m move forward properly, you know. Yes. Not a thought. 
the problem with the leaders then in the end is because they are becoming kind of the 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 the, the guiding horse or something for a community small bigger whatever and the problem is that uh the leaders then in the end they don't want to because they get intoxicated sometimes by this power of leading they don't want to give give up the leadership yeah. and it's it's actually up to them to train to bring new people yes. into training yes. and to yes. train them yes. you know it's not that the, the yes. once you get in a position then you have to oh my goodness where I do I get my skills no actually before there should be a plan before okay do you want to bring up this person succession he has first of all the qualifications and mm. he has the whatever mindset the mm. leaders have to find this out mm. it's their, mm. their responsibility mm. and then they have to train them and mm. then they put them in the position mm. then it can be successful mm. very true but i don't know even in our society i think sometimes we holding on to the last moment completely <laughs> <laughs> completely i mean you know i don't want to but I, as i said i took part in some gbc meetings and there i've heard you know, um, Gopal Bhattaprabhu, you know, who, who heads up, who brought this whole new era into ISKCON with the ILS and all these things, you know, <laughs> and the strategic planning. There was no strategic planning before Gopal Bhattaprabhu appeared on the scene and, and he introduced all these things. And he was really speaking about it so strongly, how we have to have a succession plan, you know, how we have to train the next people and and so on oh my god he was really poof, <laughs> driving the point you know so yeah all these points are there you know all these points and that again is connected with attachment you know and false ego you know and in, in my false ego book i'm also talking about this importance of delegating and passing on and not hanging on to the last breath you know, yeah. and that's why also the retirement phase is so important. You know, you know that that you know after fifty, fifty-five, we are meant to hand hand over. That's why we have so many examples of kings. You know, uh, dividing up their kingdom and poof, leaving. You know, <laughs> you know, and yeah, in some way we also have to, uh, you know, hand over and. And I observe this very often, you know, that there in those communities where the youth is empowered, you know, and this handing over has taken place, you know, there's so much wonderful spirit is happening and, the, and that attracts more youth, you know. But if this is not happening, that the youth is empowered to take over, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to get um, further, you know, I don't want to criticize, but I, I'm just making these obse observations. When you travel all the time and you visit different communities, you, you, you see, you, you analyze, you understand, you know, and, yeah, yeah, and it's not very, um, yeah, it doesn't lead to, to the, um, yeah, to, Moving on, you know, if the youth is not inspired, you know, and, and empowered, empowered. Yeah. Okay, so my God, it's really over time. Thank you so much. Person and then he ran away. <laughs> no, he's back. Now he's back. Maybe, maybe he needed it. <laughs> no, it was uh, Lochan. I was, I was oh. tending to give him over the gradually that he got some Maya boot. This is some scarra cost, then he can maintain himself with some scars and stuff. And then he just disappeared. <laughs> Maya boot. <laughs> but now, yes, he's still online now. Remember. <laughs>